Hi guys, welcome to the Sunday slot. Um, you know, this is quite an emotive subject we're going to talk about today. This is an illness. It's uh, it's a silent illness. Hardly anybody knows about this. It's always kept and nobody really talks about it. And it is a gambling addiction. So we're going to speak to the guys from Gamblers Anonymous Scotland. So we've got uh, Jed on to on with us today. Good morning, Jed. How are you? Good morning. And, I'm fine. And, uh, I'm yeah, really, really good morning, Mark. How are you? I'm good, Jim. Thanks very much. Good, guys. So let's uh, go in. Now, anybody that's watching here, please feel free to, you know, if you want to ask questions, please feel free to do that. There is a link to Gamblers Anonymous Scotland in this post. There is also a link to what we're going to talk about is the 20 questions which you should ask yourself. If you think you've got something to be concerned about, just go on and you can do that. It's it's purely anonymous, these questions. Now, clearly we've got Jed and we've got Mark. We've got no cameras on today because this is anonymous. You know, this is a this is something that's anonymous and there's a reason behind that. So Gamblers Anonymous itself was founded in 19... 57. It's a fellowship of men and women who, who share their experience, strength and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from gambling addiction. I mean, the only requirement to membership is a desire to stop gambling. That's it. And, and there are no there are no due, uh, dues or fees or you know, for GA membership. Um, there are self support to their own members' voluntary contributions. So the GA is not allied with any organisation, institution or political movement, does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any cause. In short, GA is a fellowship of equals who share a gambling problem. It is completely independent and it does not charge any membership fee, refuses any or all outside funding, and has no opinion on anything, including gambling. I was quite surprised about that. Their primary purpose is to stay gambling free and help other compulsive gamblers to do the same. I mean, Jed, that's a that's a fantastic foundation and principles, isn't it? it? It's a it's a super uh, set of principles, and it absolutely uh, has to be that way because. Our primary purpose is our members uh, that are present and the impending new member that uh, comes along. It's for protection for them, first and foremost. Yeah. And, the no and the anonymity uh, comes along with that. That's our highest principle because that's our safety. Because you can only... People who, people who don't... Do, who are just coming on this uh, brand new, um, the fear that's in a compulsive gambler or a, a person who's been under the cosh of gambling is massive. Mm -hmm. and, and what the outside world thinks of, or could think of them. And it's all about their imagination. You know what that is like. Um, and so just to get that person through the door is an immense... Uh, job basically, and uh, even even to keep them there is even a bigger job, you know, because of the, that pressure that's been built up over many many years uh, inside their heads, um, yeah. you know. So they fear they fear everything. I I feared everything, Jim. Yeah. I, I fear I feared my family finding out. I feared my wife finding out. I feared my kids finding out. I feared everything. I feared uh, my workmates. Uh, every everybody was a target for fear for me. Yeah, um, it's a hellish place to be, mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's not great, and and it, it becomes a really terrible mental problem mm -hmm. on a daily basis. Um, so, yeah, those principles were there to protect me, first and foremost, to help me feel safer. And, and if you get a person in, into that, that mold as quick as, as quick as possible, then they start to feel a wee bit yeah. better about themselves. Mark, did you feel that way as well? Yeah, Jim, yeah, the, the anonymity was a big thing for me. Uh, Mike... Gambling was secretive all the time. Uh, nobody actually, 
a lot of people knew that I liked to have a bet now and again, or so they thought it was now and again. But mm -hmm. really deep down, it was every day of the week. And it was very, very secretive. And yeah. uh, I wasn't wanting anybody to know that week in and week out, I was losing uh, like my wages or uh, putting large sums of money on horses or whatever it may be. Uh, because by and large, you never, ever won. And uh, so to be sort of deemed as a, like what you would call a loser, really, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't want anybody to think that about me. So uh, yeah, when I went into, first went into GA, uh, that's what I wanted uh, to people to be anonymity. I was actually quite scared to go to GA at first in case I knew anybody there. Because the amount the of compulsive that gamblers that I actually knew it's the fear the of walking over the door for the first time. Really, that's what it comes down to. It's that mental monster that you've built in your head about what, you know, people will judge you. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. Well, everybody, but when you when you first walk in the GA rooms, it's uh, an unbelievable experience. Well, in my case, it was uh, being in a room with, uh, maybe I don't know at that time, I think when I first GA, I think it was something like about 20 other people in the room yeah. that shared the same problem, common problem as me and understood what my mindset was and the way I thought and my thinking process and and all my defects that I had in my life over the years, but which, which was caused by compulsive gambling. Everybody seemed to have the same defects as me, yeah. which was mm -hmm. which was great for me, really, at the time. Yeah. I mean, Jed, no one, no one really runs Gamblers Anonymous, do they? I mean, there's over 90 local groups, I think, across Scotland. Yeah. There's no Chiefs or Indians in any group. Uh, there, are, there are trusted servants, which are obviously people who are a wee bit more experienced, um, you know, how, how to run a meeting, things like that. And then on a mm -hmm. bigger scale, obviously, we have a national committee yeah. uh, based on volunteer, volunteers again, uh, people who have a bit of spare time uh, in their life mm -hmm. and uh, they can come along. And that's how the organisation is run. Yeah. So there is absolute. It's a absolutely democratic. Uh, in this day and age, it's probably the only democratic uh, place I can think uh, that's truly democratic. Yeah, I, I would imagine so. I mean, these groups, are, these groups are actually held every week. Uh, typical lasting about two hours, I think. Um, and that's each group runs its own meeting in its own way. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. The, every group is autonomous. Okay, uh, in the decision making processes, but we are under a set of guidelines, which I'm sure uh, you, you know about uh, yourself. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, I could see that here. Who you, who you see here and what you hear here, when you leave here, let it stay here. Yep. Yep. It's really important that one because, again, that helps the new member, uh, it helps all members. That, yeah. uh, that they have the confidence to talk about their life uh, with impunity, you know, so that there isn't any comeback uh, whatsoever, um, you know, and that is a freedom that is a fantastic freedom uh, mm -hmm. to, to be able to do that. And they get that through the power of example in the rooms because obviously there are people there that have been there a wee while and they, they have no fear in talking about their everyday life and, and what's happened to them and sharing their story as we are doing today. Yeah. Uh, and, and that is a tremendous uh, fill-up of courage you get, uh, you know, to be able to, to, to do that, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's some common aspects coming to all GA meetings, I think. It's new members are always welcome. All members are equal, and, and racism, sexism, and other forms of discrimination are really not tolerated at all. Anonymity is expected and respected, and we use our, we never use surnames, and we do not later disclose anything said by anyone else in that meeting. That's really what comes into it. That's the initial fear that Matt talked about, about you know walking in the door. Mm -hmm. um, usually, each group will appoint a different chairperson for each meeting. Members who have been in the GA fellowship before um, will, for a while, will take a turn in the chair. And, and together, um, these individual uh, local groups from the National Fellowship of Scotland, a representative from each group regularly attends a national meeting to discuss matters affecting the fellowship as a whole. I mean, that's a, I tell you what, that's a pretty structured form of help and support. 
It is indeed. Uh, without a shadow of a doubt, uh, is that structure, uh, Jim, that binds us and holds us all together and mm. gives us the strength uh, to not only uh, to, to, to be in everything together, and togetherness is everything in GA. Uh, individually, it gives, it gives you a strength uh, to deal with this illness on mm-hmm. a daily basis, you know. Um, by ourselves, we, we have a saying in GAs, we have many sayings, but one of them is we will all hang, if we all hang, to, uh, if we don't all hang together, we will hang separately. Yeah. And, and it's a very, very powerful uh, statement because that is the truth. No doubt about it. We need people and we need people who are just like us. You know, trying to uh, do uh, you know deal with this uh, problem? Dare I say it's maybe a rising tide lifts all ships to a degree. You know, in terms of everybody helps everybody else and supports everybody else in the process. Yeah, was it uh, absolutely? Um, it is a self, as you said earlier on, self help, but the help is collective. Everything yeah. is collective in GA. Uh, we're all in, we're all in this together, and and you know, and it, it gives you that that feeling of belonging. I never ever mm-hmm. felt that, Jim. Not even in my family. I never ever felt belonging, uh, and I felt uh, you know aloof from everybody else. Uh, you know, I couldn't share anything with anybody else. I couldn't yeah. share with my mum and dad. I couldn't share with my brothers and sisters. How I truly was feeling, I felt absolutely alone. Yeah. And and when you fe- you feel like that uh, as a young person, you know uh, you you can't make any head nor tail of it. You turn that on yourself mm-hmm. because you, you don't have any answers. Yeah, and, Mark, did you feel the same yeah. way? Yeah, Jim, it was like that for me as well. That you talk about the anonymity of the of, of the fellowship, and we've got. Uh, people from all walks of life. Uh, there have been loads and loads of people up from the hierarchy down to the lower hierarchy. And for them to come into GA, they've got to find that the structure's there for people not to go out and say, oh, I, I met a famous football player at GA or whoever it may be. And yeah. it's got to stay like that. When I first came, in, came into GA, yeah, it was absolutely fantastic that I had some people who knew what I was thinking and knew what I was about, and uh, they had the same thought process as me. It was, uh, yeah, Jed actually mentioned it, uh, about the fear and the, and, the, and the loneliness of not being able to speak about your inner feelings, and uh, this place gives you the chance to do that without uh, people going to be going out there and telling people all about you and, oh, that boy done this and this boy done that, because you'll find in GA rooms that, whatever you've done in your life through gambling, uh, that there is people who have done exactly the same. And uh, it's, it's quite hard to fathom, really, uh, in a way, until you actually join a GA room, that there is people out there that's like you uh, yeah. and have done the same things, and that's what they do. You do, you do think you're all alone, don't you, in the beginning? Oh, yes, definitely. Definitely. I, as I say, I didn't think there was... Jim, all my acquaintances were all were all probably compulsive gamblers themselves, and I yeah. didn't know any other thing. And uh, w- when you join a GA room and you're trying to change your life and you're trying to get your life better, and it's amazing how these rooms work in that sense to not make you feel alone. And over the years I've been in GA now, the amount of friends I've made, and I can meet them any time, whether it be in a supermarket or on the street or and well, before the COVID was in, in bars or restaurants and you can speak away, but nobody discloses who you are or where they know you from. It's usually, you usually come away with something like, uh, where do you know Jed from? Well, it just yeah. so happens that I work with Jed, but so that's quite easy for me that way. Uh, yeah. But if there's, if there's someone else in the street that you meet and somebody says, well, where do you know, say, Tom from? I say, well, I know Tom from playing golf with him. It's some kind of excuse you make up. It's a little lie, which, which, which G doesn't yeah. like people doing, but at the end of the day, you're saving their anonymity. 
But the, yeah, that is the difficult. I mean, if you're a bit more high profile and you don't want anybody to know, it's exactly what Jed said about, you know, if you're a, a high full, full profile footballer or somebody like that, mm -hmm. the last thing you want to know is somebody coming out of GA and saying, you know, and then saying, oh, I know this person from GA. Um, uh, that's that's obviously the worry for, for most people. But you're absolutely right. It's, it's anonymity more than anything. And no one talks about it unless, you know, uh, unless it's between yourselves. That's it. That's where the well, first 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 names come in. Um, yeah. it just just as a side thing, uh, Jim, I've known people in the fellowship for literally literally years and years and years, <laughs> and I still only know their first name because we get that right. used to we get that used to not asking for surnames. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, and it could be quite awkward sometimes at conventions when we're at hotels and stuff like that, and the hotel asks. <laughs> I ask you what your name is and stuff like that. And yeah. But but we'll get over it. We do. So let's talk about the problem of compulsive gambling. Before coming to GA, many compulsive gamblers thought of themselves as morally weak or just no good. Um, the GA concept is that the compulsive, compulsive gambler is very a sick person, uh, suffering from an incurable disease. Remember, this is an incurable disease to a degree. It's not just something that you switch off and switch on when you need it. Um, who can recover by following a very simple procedure? But it's actually sticking to that procedure is the most important thing and being a part of that procedure and not wavering from it. For many, this illness brings both misery and devastation. The suffering often extends to family and friends, debt relationships, difficulties, mentally and a, a, a physical abuse are some of the most common consequences. There are also uh, there also be employment problems or trouble in the law. Uh, the desperation compulsive gamblers can resort to almost any measure to get money to gamble. And health consequences for a gambler and those around the gambler include depression, anxiety, other stress-related disorders, and even suicidal tendencies. Um, I mean, GA members tend to view their addiction not as a financial problem. This is the key here. It's not a financial problem, but as an emotional one, requiring a personality change from within their selves. I mean, is that that's a real great description about what this is, Jed, isn't it? It is absolutely, John. Uh, it is what we are. Um, and certainly what we were. Um, it is an emotional illness. And and how it affects us is that it cuts off our emotions. So it appears on the face of it, we don't have a conscience. And, you know, the things that people take for granted and how they feel about other, other human beings and family members and, and things like that, we appear to be totally aloof of that. Yeah. Uh, which obviously doesn't give us a good name uh, within the family unit or, or at the workplace or wherever we are. Um, I became a pretender, Jim. Mm -hmm. I had to pretend to be those things because I didn't feel them. Um, I didn't feel them because I felt very, very uh, low, low self-esteem, as, as you described there. Uh, you know, I didn't really rate myself in any shape or form. I was forever comparing myself from a knee height to a grasshopper with other people. Yeah. And they all tended to be maybe know the right people to compare yep. myself yep. with. So I started acting out how they acted out and their behaviours, whereas I didn't know me at all. I had no idea who I, I truly was, and that's where the fear came in. Yeah. Who, well, who, who was I? I could be anybody, you know? Um, do, you want and, to, do you want to talk a bit more about your journey and about how this has all come about and how, you know, Jed? Yeah. Okay, so from from that kind of grounding, you know, and my father, <coughs> my, my father, my father was an alcoholic. And my mother had six kids to look after, including me. Um, I always thought I was a middle child until it was pointed out many years later in GAJ. How can you be a middle child of six? So uh, my maths wasn't that good, obviously. So anyway, uh, that's how I felt. I felt totally isolated. There was four years up to the sibling up above and four years down. And I, and I, I just felt I had no one. Uh, you know, 
Um, I did not understand what was going on in the household with my father. Um, all, all I ever, ever heard was shouting, bawling and screaming. And how I, how I dealt with that was I retreated to my room where and stared out the window into space, into what I call my dream world, you know, into this place where I was a great guy and all the rest of it. But I never, ever really felt like a great guy. It was mm -hmm. all something else jumped in, which Bob had mentioned, is ego. Yeah. Ego is a huge defense mechanism for compulsive gamblers. It stops us from feeling like we're the lowest of the low. But unfortunately, it doesn't stop us from feeling we're the highest of the high. Yeah. And, and that we are number one. And, and we are selfish to a fault over that, and especially when we become compulsive gamblers. Um, you know, because it is, it is a protection against the world, a protection to get getting found out. Uh, well, I, I was a compulsive warrior before I became a compulsive liar, before I became a compulsive gambler. So those two things before I became were really important in, as to why I ended up a compulsive gambler because yeah. uh, because the lying became to such a point through the ego that I believed every word I was saying. So if I was talking to anybody, they in general believed every anything I said. And that's extremely dangerous for them, obviously, but it was also extremely dangerous for me because I was digging a deeper and deeper hole for myself. And yeah. I was spending longer and longer in the gambling environment because that became my safe place, John. That, that, that was my safe place. My safe place wasn't out in society, in my family home or whatever. My safe yeah. place was in the bookies. That was my safe place. And as soon as that door shut behind me, I felt at home there. That became my home. And the nightmare uh, happened as soon as that door, the, the bookies shut at my time. They shot uh, quite early in the day, five, five six o'clock at night. And I, I opened that door into the nightmare of my life. And I didn't want to leave there. I wanted to stay there because yeah. no one could touch me there. No one could uh, interrogate me there. I didn't have to tell a lie in there. I was the lie in there. Yeah. And so outside, I'd walk the streets for hours uh, before I went home so as I could think up a lie I hadn't already told before or one that fitted in with uh, 20 lies before and whatever. And if, that, and if that didn't help me, then I created an argument in the house so I could disappear again as quick as possible. Uh, a hellish spiral um, that went on for quite a long time, uh, Jim, and back to the mental thing, absolutely, this is a mental problem. No doubt about that. And it affects us uh, in every shape and form mentally. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and to get into reality, how do you get into reality from that point? Uh, for me, Jim, uh, it was cataclysmic. Um, I went to the nth degree, uh, uh, taking my family uh, for that terrible, terrible uh, ride. Uh, you know, and they all came with me on it because um, they couldn't do anything else. I had mm -hmm. made the situation, their situation, and you, you, you touched on it earlier, and this is a real important thing, people who are associated with us, they are on the receiving end of that mental torture as well. Yeah. Um, and through various means. For me, my, my torture to them was, uh, was all mental. It wasn't mm -hmm. physical, but there are people who go through that process as well. I, I didn't need to. My father, I learned that from my father. My, I always said, I'm never, ever going to end up like my father. He could, he could crucify anybody a hundred paces with his, with his words. Yeah. And, I, and I became exactly the same and probably even worse. So I, I can admit that today and accept that today. Um, you know, I became just like him. I, was, uh, I had an addiction, I had an illness, uh, a different one. But it acted exactly the same. I saw what it did to my mother. I, you know, I saw, I saw all that, uh, living, living with an alcoholic. And, uh, 
And yet, that didn't, that didn't make me think about me when I was going through that process. And uh, yeah. I was so caught up uh, in, in me, you know, and, and always running away in the head, always running mm. away f from situations. I, I, could, I could, in a nanosecond, uh, say, no, that never happened. Now, you can just imagine, that could be anything that, that's just happened. But yeah. I could just say, no, that never happened. So it actually happened right in front of you, but you're just Absolutely. denying it straight away. Absolutely. Um, that's how powerful it is. And, I mean, and to think, and you know this is actually happening. You know this, but you can't stop yourself from these situations because you're constantly trying to run away you're out of that situation. Yeah. And as you, as you mentioned in the pamphlet, uh, desperation, we will go to any, any kind of desperate uh, uh, state to get ourselves out of that situation yeah. or, to, or to get money to carry on that, uh, that addiction. Um, mm -hmm. and, that, and that's a constant. I, many of us can't sleep at night. Many, many, many hours, wake, uh, totally awake, worrying, where are we going to get the, the money to either uh, catch up on bills or wherever, or that's mounting up, the debt is uh, mounting up and all the rest of it, all through the gambling. And you would suddenly go, Eureka, ah, right, I know where I'm going to get the money. I'm going to uh, get my money. You know, and then you'd have about an hour's sleep after it. And yeah. in a way, you're into the next day. Because I'll cut a long story short, Jim. I came to the point where the mental exhaustion was so great in me. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to tell another, another lie. That file cabinet was so full and bursting, you know. Yeah. And I'd started to lose that key thing in the compulsive gambler's armory, memory. Yeah. Memorizing all those lies before I started to have great difficulty because of exhaustion to be able to remember the It's a classic lie. example of one lie leads to the next lie, leads to the yeah. next lie, leads to the next lie. And yeah. it's like, if you don't tell a lie in the first place, you'll no yeah. need to cover up with the rest yeah. of the lies to yeah. cover up for that. Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're smiling at that, but obviously if you're on the receiving end of those lies, it's no fun. Mm. And... And we, we create mental problems for other people that, that yeah. live around us. There's no two ways about that. And I, but but, we but are you, like, don't, you don't see that, do you? You don't see that no. when you're in that zone. It's, no, uh, we don't. I mean, nowadays, I mean, obviously, when I, got, when I reach the fellowship, uh, there is a, we have a sister fellowship called Gamma Non. Who, it's very important to mention for people out there who are listening, for people who are living with people who have a gambling problem. You know, that, mm -hmm. that's, that's their fellowship, and they've been just as uh, uh, effective in my recovery as, as GA, because you have to hear the other side to get the full picture of and, just how powerful this is. And that's an organisation for the families and people uh, affected family and friends. By, by the person's gambling addiction. Yeah. Um, because they, they, can, they can go yeah. and speak in an anonymity as well about yeah. how they're feeling about it and what they can do to help. That's correct. And that's really important too, because then they have a place that they can talk about their experiences, you know, not just our experiences, yeah. you know, their experiences. And it's a fantastic fellowship as well, you know, and, uh, and we, we absolutely are integrated with them. In, in a lot of ways, uh, because yeah. we've got to we've got to re keep reminding ourselves that did happen, mm -hmm. that was us, not to punish us uh, ourselves, because we have to live today, you know, uh, the best way we possibly can, and facing up to things is definitely uh, very important, but also knowing how to live with people and being in relationships with people on equal yeah. terms is exactly really just as important. Yeah, uh, I'm just trying to get Matt on, um, and there seems to be something wrong with his mic just now. I uh, have Matt could unmute. There you go. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Matt, yeah. Um, so Matt, uh, you know what? What's your story? I mean, what's what? How did you come to be uh, at GA? Yeah, Jim. Well, 
The story's quite similar to Jed's, actually. Uh, yeah. as, as I find it, but everybody in the fellowship, their stories are quite similar, although they're different. But uh, I, I was an only child myself, uh, an only child. My father was also an alcoholic, like Jed's. And, uh, yeah. But my father always worked and my mother always worked. <coughs> and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I was brought up in a, a, a very good household, uh, yeah. I never wanted for nothing. I was probably uh, spoilt. But from a very, very early age, I don't know what it was. Uh, I took to gambling at a very, very age. I, I think I was a compulsive gambler from about the age of four or five years of age. Yeah. Uh, I used to go to the slot machines in the arcades. Uh, all my pocket money would go in there. And that just followed me right through life. Uh, Do you think it's something you're born with? Uh, no, not really, Jim. No, I, I don't know. Uh, okay. it's, it's a hard thing to say I, I wouldn't say it's been passed down to the generations I think the compulsive mm -hmm. is in you to do something if I yeah. wasn't a compulsive gambler I would have been a compulsive something else okay yeah. but, uh, so, as I said yeah, addictions at a very early, early age and then what, what happened after that then yeah well I carried on through life but then I turned into also I wasn't just a compulsive gambler I was a compulsive liar like Jed said and I was a compulsive thief as well you couldn't leave anything down in front of me and or I'd be away with it uh, yeah. steal money because uh, obviously to feed the addiction I carried yeah. on through life just going through life as a non-entity basically and mm -hmm. uh, I got to the age uh, 17 Although it was just arcades and bandits and uh, one-armed bandits and slot machines and pubs and, and arcades, but I was still the same. I started work, uh, when I left the school at 16, and I yeah. always remember remember being proud of having my first wage. Uh -huh. I, I think it was, if I go back these years, it was £16.40. I always remember it. And I, and I gave my mum, I used to give my mum £5 board money. And the other £11.40, that went into the bandit that was in the local chip shop. And... Yeah. The maximum you can win out of that uh, slot machine was something like a pound. Yeah. And I went and put 14 pound, uh, sorry, uh, 11 pound in this bandit to win a pound, basically. And that just shows yeah. you where the place, where the gambling actually took me. And that followed me right through my life until I was 17, 18. And then I found what you, uh, the bookmakers. I was able to get in the booties. And uh, absolutely, as soon as I walked in, and Jed mentioned in his, his bit of story there, when I walked into the bookies, I felt I was in a safe place. Mm -hmm. But I was going in there, and I would say, I would, I would go into the bookies in the morning at 11 o'clock, and I was, this is before all the night racing and everything else started, and the bookmaker used to close at 5 o'clock. But I'd be in there from 11 o'clock in the morning to 5 o'clock at night, and I'm talking about yeah. nearly every single day. Uh, I worked in between times, but I used to dodge off work. It affects your workplace, and then it yeah. affects your family, and... My mother always knew that I had a problem, but my father, with his own addiction, he actually never noticed it. He just thought, look, you have a gamble, why don't you stop? Well, it's not as easy as that, really. And uh, I, I would have thought that he would have knew that with the addiction that he had himself. But uh, yeah. I carried on through life, and a lot of times, as I say, with my mother and father uh, both working full time, I had this sort of sense of being on my own a lot, and able to mm -hmm. do what I wanted. And this sort of took me to places that I didn't really want to be going to uh, mentally yeah. as well. And uh, so anyway, I ended up uh, 18, 19, I met what I, would, what, what I now class my first wife. Uh, we got married quite, quite early and had children quite early. It, was, it gave me a sort of purpose in life mm -hmm. uh, and somebody to cling on to really. It was a case of I didn't like being on my own, and yeah. I was on because I was on my own for that for that many many years. But we got married, and we quickly had. Uh, I've got three boys now, uh, three lovely sons, who uh, I'm in touch with every day and who I adore so much. And I've have I've actually got uh, four grandchildren as well. So honestly, life just can't get any better just now. But the, uh -huh. the gambling in between that times, I kept on going on and on and on, Jim. And then uh -huh. it got to the stage where I just couldn't take any more. I was mentally drained. Yeah. The gambling had got me, they say it's in the books that the gambling had me beat and my life was incapable of living. Uh -huh. I, I never ever went to question 20 in the book, the, 
uh, prepare to take my own life. But on many, many occasions, I thought that, what's the point of me being here? I'm not doing anybody any good here. Why should I be here? Oh, wait a minute, I can take some tablets here, or I can jump in front of a bus or do something like that, and then that would be everybody else around me's problem solved. But I wouldn't yeah. have been, I would have left devastation behind me as well. And that's, but that's how selfish uh, uh, the ways I was thinking. Hmm. But, it, but it is an illness that affects the brain, really, and, and you don't think rationally, do you? No, no. I, I always thought outside the box. I always thought I was cleverer than everybody else. Uh, when I knew I wasn't really, uh, as I said, the lies that came into my life was unbelievable. Uh, I don't know if that was like to make me look as if I was somebody more than what I actually was. Yeah. I probably was at that time. Uh, stupid things. You, you used to say stupid things like, uh, oh, I, I had trials with Aston Villa or I had trials with Liverpool Football Club, and, I, and which was just a lot, a, lot, a lot of rubbish. It was just absolute nonsense that used to come out of my mouth. But at that time when I used to say those kind of lies and nonsense, it made me feel better within. Yeah. And then, then at the end of the day, the, the same thing came about when I got so low and I felt down, I used to go to the bookmakers to gamble to make me feel better. And that's what that done. It gave you that adrenaline rush. I wasn't it's scared. That, oh, pardon? It's the rush and the high that you get as a result of doing that. Yes. And, and, and not even if... Uh, at the time, obviously, you, you're not want to be going in there t to lose money, but inevitably, you end up you do. And but yeah. to go in there just to get that rush for me, it was like a horse running up the up to the line, close, close neck and neck, and the photo finish. And the excitement you got out of that was unbelievable, and the rush you got of that, and it made you feel better. If, if I was feeling low, that's when I had to go. I went to the bookies to make me feel better. It's, and it's where the is high, wish. that high you get from it, Mark, isn't it? It's that rush you get all the time. And I've often, I've often heard people say that it doesn't matter about the money. If it was buttons, you would still do it because it's yeah. just the, the feeling that you get as a result of it. Jim, I've, I've seen myself walking in the bookmakers with 50 pence. And then I've seen me walking in the book, bookmakers with a, a full month's wage and lost it just the same yeah. or winning off it just the same and still getting that same kind of feeling. So, so it wasn't about the money. It was about my inner self being able to get this feeling back to me that I, if maybe I was feeling down or feeling... But what I should have been doing is I, I should have been concerning myself to make myself feel better, to get myself involved with my family. As I say, I had three beautiful sons and I should have been involved with myself with them a lot more and that should have made me feel better. But the gambling compulsion wouldn't allow me to do that. And mm -hmm. that's what happened with me. Addiction's a very, very big thing. I mean, Jed, um, we've, we've talked about this before, about addiction and about the fact that you just want to keep doing it. Um, and everything else gets zoned out and, and gets everything else. It's a blinkered approach to it. Um, and you become self-obsessed and you want that rush and that high all the time as a result. How do you break out that cycle? Well, I've... When I, I, I didn't really realise until I got in uh, the GA door that uh, the mechanisms of what was making me want to go and do that. Um, you t it takes a bit of time, and that's where uh, GA comes into play because it gives you a bit of headrest. Yeah. That's really, really important from yourself. It distracts you into a different place. Mm -hmm. it, it eventually gives you a bit of calm, you know, uh, a bit, and dare I say it, eventually a bit of peace, because all I ever ever had in my head was noise, mm -hmm. and it was the noise of my illness saying, basically, get to the get to the bookies, get to the bookies, you know. Um, so that rush that Matt's talking about, I then understood the mechani mechanisms of what this was all about. Because as he, the key thing Matt said there was, it didn't matter whether you won or whether you lost. Yeah. He was still getting, and here it is. We don't take substances for this addiction. We don't take drugs. We don't take alcohol like other addictions. We are creating that in our own brain, and it's called adrenaline. Yeah. And that adrenaline is the drug of a compulsive gambler. And it pumps 
to such a high extent it takes over everything else in the mind and it's at those moments and i mean some of the biggest adrenaline attacks i uh, i had uh were the very last race uh the doors were going to be closed yeah i'm waiting on this result this result means whether my family have tea to eat or not yeah not buckets of money not uh you know whatever it's just i was meant to be bringing food in for the family for tea that was a yeah. task that i i had uh, i had been given and i wasn't going to be able to do that if this hadn't come in yeah and see if they tried to shut those doors before i found that result and not pay me out all hell would have broken loose in, yeah. the, in that in that place and that that adrenaline was so pumped up at that moment because everything is riding on that moment and that's yeah. what this illness does it doesn't have to be it doesn't even have to be a gamble mm -hmm. it could be anything in life it could be you're going to get found out and going to get sacked if they find out you've been in the bookies half the day and you haven't been doing your work it's when people you know, do danger sports and jump off cliffs Absolutely. With small tiny parachutes, it's that adrenaline rush that everybody seeks. Absolutely, and so, but unfortunately, I never sought it, but I was I was getting it. Yeah. So you have a recovery program, which is the twelve steps. I mean, obviously, step number one, and I'll go through it, is honesty. Two, open mindedness. Three, willingness. Four, courage. Five, integrity. Six, preparedness. Seven, humility. Um, eight reconciliation nine responsibility 10 perseverance 11 mindfulness and 12 sharing i mean the ga program is really based on that 12-step recovery and is adopted yeah. by many fellowship supporters supporting people recovering from addiction throughout the world i mean most ga members um regard the addiction to compulsive gambling as an illness progressive for nature um it can be a, a, arrested but never cured um the treatment of their illness through attending ga meetings and, and the working uh, the steps is, is based on both abstinence from gambling and all its various forms and also bringing about a personality change from within ourselves. I mean, this is a programming thing when you think about it. Um, group unity is central to our recovery. Uh, most of us at various times tried to stop or control our gambling uh, by ourselves through willpower alone, but a lot of people it just doesn't work. They have to have that support mechanism for it to work. It's a classic example. It's like, oh, I'm cured, and like they're off. And it's, they didn't realize it's like, wait a minute, it's the constant contact and support that actually keeps continuing to have you in that space at that point in time, isn't it, Ajed? Absolutely, Jim. But one, one other thing, the, the word that you haven't said, and you, you mentioned it earlier on in the, the talk, is discipline. Yeah. I had no discipline in my life. I was the most ill-disciplined person. I had no structure, that structure and discipline. I had nothing to hold on to. I had no power of example from my family, it's my father, uh, you know, about uh, living a half-decent life or, or whatever. You know, I, all I saw was uh, chaos, you know, chaos, uh, living, living, living on a, a knife edge all the time. Um, so I'm not blaming my father and I will never blame my father for me being a compulsive gambler. I am a compulsive gambler and that's the end of it. Uh, how I became it, I, I tend to, to believe it's more environmental than genetic, but then yep. other, other people, other people will, uh, might have a different idea about that, but it's not essential. I know any of these things. What is essential is that program works that you're talking about. And that mm -hmm. program does work, uh, not only for myself, for so, so many people that have come in contact in the fellowship over the years. It has worked. Yeah. It doesn't work for people who don't want it to work. It doesn't work Absolutely. for people I mean, you, who, the 90% the, the uh, of the battle yeah. is actually understanding it's going to work for you. And if you believe that, if the yeah. mind of a man can believe, he can conceive, yeah. and actually that will, it will work for that person. That's really what it comes down to, doesn't it? Absolutely. And but within within that program, every step of that program is is all about recovery. It's all about acceptance. 
of what actually be, uh, being honest with yourself at long last and that's the key honesty is being honest with yourself because if you're not honest with yourself you're not going to be honest with anybody and yeah. honest and honesty uh, and uh, i know uh, it may sound to people after us uh, telling them they're compulsive liars and all the rest of it it can happen it actually can't you can reverse that well you have and, to start somewhere don't you yeah absolutely and the power of example again you're showing that you know at the meetings the way the people are so honest about their uh their selves it is it, it really rubs off on you and it mm. makes you feel yeah you can do that too and it's and every every one of those steps is is um, as important as uh as as the very first one the yeah. first one is important because that's the start as you say that and i think i think that's where it's the the families have to be involved to a degree as well because yeah. for them it's like i've heard it all before yeah you know it's like it's and, and but sincerely for people that go to ga that are have taken that leap of faith that this is going to help them through that process and the people around about them are going to support them so you've got to embrace that and move mm -hmm. forward with that and 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 just give that a little bit of trust again. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. You use those two words, faith and then trust. For me, Jim, I don't need to be trusted anymore. Mm -hmm. I I used to say, well, do you know, trust me. <laughs> and absolutely, no one should, should have been able to trust me yeah. uh, at some points in my life. So that, that word trust, I, I, I very rarely use that word trust. Okay, yeah. but see the word faith, that's a totally different thing because that is what I have. I've got a faith in myself now today. And I hope through my actions and my behavior that, that I have today, that people will have faith in me. You know, mm -hmm. not necessarily trust, not necessarily trust. And that goes for probably the partners, uh, the wives, the husbands, uh, things like that you know um yeah. it's it is about faith because i show my faith in action now it's all about action words is words isn't it words yeah. you know and it's I, the, I old, it's the old phrase yeah. about what you do shouts more loudly i can't hear you that's um it. that's really what it comes down to so it's your actions speak louder than words absolutely and uh you learn that very very quickly in ga because can we, go, can we go through some of the questions, Jed? Um, yes. Some of the questions for people out there that actually think, you know, you, you're probably denying yourself. You're maybe in denial. You maybe don't realise you've got an issue here. But if you're running out of money all the time and you're just running down to the bookies or going online gambling or doing anything like that, online's a big thing just now in lockdown, isn't it? It's a huge thing, you know, where people are just hiding in their room, uh, essentially, and just gambling uh, everything they've got. But but there's nothing, there's no mechanism really to stop them there. I know you're not political about it, but, you know, because that's your stance as GA. But in my opinion, it's like there's not enough controls there to help people to, to, to curb that appetite, to stop them doing that. I've seen people lose businesses, um, houses, um, families, uh, husbands and wives and partners through gambling over the years now i they they don't know i know but I've, I've just seen it i've just seen it happen right in front of my eyes just putting money all the time into slot machines every two seconds it's amazing when you walk into a pub and your pint of beer ends up costing you 50 pound because it sits on top of the machine and all you do is play it all the time and and that is a powerful thing a pint of beer could cost you 50 pound or more so we'll go through some of these questions, Jed, you know, and, and fine, okay. we don't need to answer them, but it's just to give everybody an idea about what, um, and you answer them to yourselves as the people uh, we would say that. I mean, some of these, did you ever lose time from work or school due to gambling? I mean, even school, you know, it's, a, it's as Matt said, it's an early age, you know, he started and, and he, he was addicted. Um, another one, has gambling ever made your home life unhappy? Um, has gambling affected your reputation? Um, have you ever felt remorse after gambling? Um, do you ever gamble to get money uh, to, from which to pay debts or otherwise solve financial difficulties? Um, do you gambling uh, cause a decrease in your ambition or your efficiency? Um, um, also, um, after losing, did you feel you must return as soon as possible to win back your losses? Um, after you, after a win, 
did you have a strong urge to return and win more? It's like, I, I think in, in my mind, the only, way, or the only way to win is never to play. That's the reality. Um, and, I, and a lot of people say that to me with the lottery. Do you play the lottery? And I went, no, really, but I win all the time because I don't play it. Um, do you often gamble until your last pound was gone? Um, did you ever borrow to finance your gambling? Um, have you ever sold anything to finance your gambling? Um, are you, were you reluctant to use gambling money for normal expenditure? Um, did you did gambling make you careless of the welfare of yourself and your family? Um, did did you ever gamble longer than you planned? Um, have you ever gambled to escape worry or trouble? Um, did you ever did you ever have you ever committed or considered committing an illegal act to finance your gambling? Um, did gambling cause you have to difficulty in your sleeping? Um, do arguments, uh, disappointments or frustrations create with you uh, with an urge to gamble? Um, did you ever have the urge to celebrate any good fortune after a few hours by gambling? And I think the final one here is that this is this is you. We spoke about this, Jed, um, off air. Have you ever considered self-destructing or suicide as a result of gambling? I mean, that's that is the ultimate price that you pay, isn't it? That is exactly it, uh, Jim. That is unfortunately. Uh, true to life. Uh, that's not a figment of anybody's imagination uh, mm -hmm. or, or whatever. Uh, I, I have lost uh, a lot of good friends over the years. Um, people who um, came into GA uh, did relatively well initially, but then, as you alluded to earlier on, thought they'd cracked it. Uh, and that terrible word cure, which doesn't exist, uh, for us, and uh, and they committed suicide, mm -hmm. and because they'd allowed the illness to get a grip of them again, and what tends to happen is it gets worse. It never ever gets better, and you yeah. don't go back out of GA uh, on uh, on that mark. It only goes down. It's down yeah. immediately, and it's harder to come back. People do manage to get back, and thankfully, they, they eventually uh, uh, get back on track again, but through a lot of hard work and a lot of support and help. Mm -hmm. um, so that last one is the ultimate. Is that what you want for yourself? And I know for me it was at one point. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, I was on my way uh, to do that. Uh, higher power, call it what you like. Uh, I ended up in a telephone kiosk and uh, I, 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 woke it and I, I put it in and I phoned my mother and uh, she told me to come home uh, to her and I was on the phone to the Samaritans for three hours after that and I got the number for GA and the rest is history. But yeah. uh, the, bottom, the bottom line is uh, GA now has so many different uh, ways of get, being contacted, as uh, as you've probably uh, got uh, got there in front of you, Jim. Yeah. Uh, there are so many ways uh, to confidentially have a chat with another uh, uh, GA member. Uh, it's an, an amazing fellowship, and hopefully, hopefully, gives people an opportunity to get those kind of thoughts out of their head. And that they can get started uh, on a new life, you know, a better life. Mm -hmm. um, and it is possible. There's no doubt about that. I mean, the other one that stood out for me, I, I answered 17 out of the 20, by the way, on my yeses on my first first night in GA. Uh, about, what, for three weeks later, I looked at them again and it was 20 out of 20. Yeah. Because honesty kicked in. Um, because people do tend uh, to, uh, when they get hit with questions like that, uh, think about it and think, God, what am I admitting here to other people they've never met before? But the point, of, the point of the exercise is just to show the person how far down the line they are with this illness and the gambling. It's, it's a startling revelation to, to see that uh, these 20 questions, that if you answer yes to seven or more, that mm -hmm. you, you possibly could have a problem. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's something you really need to to look within yourself to 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 yeah. really become come face to face with yourself and say, are uh, uh, possible it might, and and then that's when you're absolutely right. It is reaching out and speaking to people in a, a similar vein, and and don't not feel ashamed of what you're doing, but in confidentiality. And it's just it's just making that initial 
that initial leap of faith. Matt, did you see? Did you feel a similar way? Absolutely. It's yeah, Jim. Yeah, it's the similar to Jed. I answered seventeen out of twenty questions myself. Uh, yeah. Because there were, there were a couple of questions there. I think it's number 16. Uh, have you ever considered or committed a crime to finance your gambling? Now, I wasn't wanting to sit in a room full of strangers and say that I was a thief and that I'd mm -hmm. stole money and I'd robbed places and done whatever I'd done to get money because what I would think, what they would think of me. But at the end of the day, as I found out, and as Jed says, I never ever contemplated question 20. I think it was too much of a coward for that. But uh, yeah. there was passing, passing thoughts. At, that's what we'd call them, passing thoughts. But never ever went down the road of trying to attempt it or do anything about it. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it was 19 out of 20. And yes, every one of them was an honest answer, apart from, as I say, from, from the two questions. Because there was no way in the world I was going to wait to admit to 20, 20 odd people that I was a, a thief and a liar. <laughs> Although... At the end of the day, I was in a room full of thieves and liars. At the end of the day, but I, I, was, down, I was about to say that you don't realise that actually you're in the you're in the you're in people in a similar situation, and and it's it just takes that leap of faith to actually open up and say, you know, I need help. Yeah, I, I hear, and that's the, the, you're bang on there, Jim. The operative word being is there asking for help. Uh, if you don't ask for help, you won't get it. Uh, mm -hmm. I was desperate and needed some kind of someone to sort me out. I knew something was wrong with me, but I just couldn't place it. Did I think it was compulsive gambling? No, I really didn't think it was compulsive gambling because everybody I knew uh, gambled. It was a yeah. way of life. Uh, meet your pals on a Saturday in the pub on a Saturday, go and put your football coupons on, nip in and out, in and out to the bookies. But I knew something was, wasn't right with me because all my friends that didn't gamble, which wasn't many, by the way, yeah. Uh, they seemed to have a great life. They were able to go out. They had cars, new cars. They had. Uh, they were able to go out and sell, buy themselves new clothes. And here's me going about with rags on my back. And I'm yeah. like, well, how is that? How how are they able to go? I've got a good job. He's got a good job. I'm earning more money than him in my job. But how has he got a new car? And I'm going to put an uh, an old banger, really. Yeah. But the bottom line was that they weren't gamblers. I've got a best friend who's been my friend now for, we were at school together when we were 14, so we're talking now like 40 odd years, being best friends, best mates. And uh, we st he stuck by me all these years and uh, he actually gave me my uh, pin which, celebrates, which celebrated me being 10 years off a bet. And he stuck by me all the time. But every time we were in a pub or anything like that, he used to be standing at the bar and talking to everybody, and I was standing at, the, as you say, at the bandit with the twenty-pound pint. I know it's just it's just a crazy, crazy thing. Yeah, I, yeah. I think I think the way forward, that's an hour up, guys. I mean, we're 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 coming to the end of the show, so you know we can recap here that that really it's all about reaching out to to you guys, and and you know uh, even listen, even if you reach out and you realise you don't have a problem, <laughs> then then you've ticked that box, and it's like. Fantastic. I know that's not the issue for me, um, but but you're you're better to be honest with yourself and upfront with yourself in the beginning. Is that is that probably your final thought, Jed? Yeah, without without a doubt. Uh, I mean, you might you might still be totally confused of why you've found yourself in this situation. You might yeah. have a massive poor me. Uh, you know, why has this happened to me? The world is against you, and all the rest of it. But when, the, when you've made that move to come into GA, made that contact, it changes and it can change. And that mindset that you were talking about, Jim, does change. The yeah. longer you're there, uh, the power of the place, the collective, that feeling, of, uh, you know, you're in some place that totally understands you is so, so important. And that is the reason why I'm talk, uh, talking here uh, all that time later, because I still have to do all these things that I'm, we, we've uh, shared about new members, I'm still doing that. I'm still totally involved in the fellowship. And I'm loving life. I'm yeah, absolutely but, loving life. And that's, you know? that's a brilliant, fantastic note to end on, Jed. And, and I could only thank the two of you, Jed and Matt, for coming on. For anybody else out there, there is a, a link in this post, as I said, to 
the GA Scotland website, please feel free to visit it. Um, and also, if you want the 20 questions, it's on there as well. Um, until next week, guys, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. And uh, and I'll see everybody next week on the Sunday slot. Thanks, Jim. Thank Thanks, you very Matt. much, Jim. You're welcome. Thank you, Jim.